So Apple has released the second beta in their iPadOS 15.5 update, and there's a couple new features that I did want to point out, and one specifically, which I think means a lot more to the third-party applications inside of the App Store, and you guys are going to be extremely happy about it. So without further ado, let's get into it. So let's get right into this video, everybody. The first thing I'm gonna show you is how big the build number was. So if you go to the photos, I took a screenshot. Unfortunately, it was already downloaded by the time I could check how big it was, but I do believe it's under one gigabyte in order to get this installed. So give yourselves about two gigs of open storage inside of the actual iPad to get this installed correctly and to avoid any issues when actually getting it installed and restarting the device. Because I have run into the issue where I didn't have enough space and then I had to kind of reboot my entire system until I had to actually get it updated. But to avoid that, just make sure you have at least twice as much storage as what you would need in order to get this installed to avoid any issues. The next thing I'm gonna show you is what build number we're on. So if we go into the settings, we go into the about section, click on the actual firmware number in the software version, you can see that we're on 15.519F50557 lowercase e. So that is to let you know that as we're moving forward, Apple's moniker goes down lower and lower until we get to that A version. Finally, that RC edition, and then we go into the public release schedule, which again, should be out in the next three to four weeks. Definitely expect this before WWDC because WWDC will be the announcement of iPadOS 16, which again, maybe I shouldn't be this hopeful, but I'm very hopeful that Apple's gonna give us something like a pro mode with iPadOS. In terms of actual tangible differences, there weren't too many that you could actually use immediately when it comes to iPadOS 15.5 beta 2. So the first one that actually jumped out was inside the control center. If you guys have Shazam enabled in your control center, all you have to do is go into settings, go into your control center and make sure that Shazam is actually in there. And that's basically the music recognition shortcut. So if you go in there, go into your control center and long press, you now have the ability to see your history when looking at your Shazam song. So if you go into a coffee shop, you don't know what the name of the song is, you turn on the Shazam music recognition, and then even if you wanna go back to it later to find out what song that was, it'll always be there. And if you click on it, it'll take you exactly where you need to be. So here it's gonna take you into the Shazam app, which I don't actually have. I just like to have the music recognition app because Shazam is tied to Apple Music, but I am actually a Spotify user. So now you know that Shazam gives you a nice little history list whenever you're looking at new Shazam music. Another interesting one, which wasn't really a feature or anything like that, but if you go into Safari, and then you press a little share button right here, you now have the ability to share an entire page, but you can see that that ability was there before, just the glyph is a little bit different. It went from being just a larger magnifying glass, and now you can see that it switched into a smaller magnifying glass with the actual piece of paper right there to let you know that you're on a page. It makes a little bit more sense when it comes to finding on a page, but that's just a little glyph that was changed inside of iOS and iPadOS. And then to stay on the screen, Apple actually implemented a new enhanced fraud protection. Whenever you have fraud protection enabled, credit cards in your wallet app. So it's not just for the Apple card, it works with whatever card you have in your actual Apple wallet. So now you know that inside of here, you know that you're working with Apple to make sure that your fraud protection has the highest level of security when actually using that card. So it's kind of like a double fraud protection. You get fraud protection directly from your provider, your credit card provider. And then on top of that, you get whatever Apple's doing. So this is a step-by-step -step way of actually how to set it up. So I'll link this down below if you guys do want to check it out. But I do like that Apple's including more and more protection because again, in a world where we're putting everything on our devices, all our financials, all our credit cards and things like that, it's better to stay as protected as possible and not to stop at that 2FA situation. And then the last feature that I do want to show you is actually inside of the release notes. So if we go into the release notes, this is what was dropped for iPadOS 15.5 beta 2. A lot of it had to do with Apple Pay and authentication and then a lot of stuff for developers. So if we scroll down, you can see that this is all for StoreKit. So most of this has to do with Apple allowing App Store developers to now take payment outside of the App Store so they don't have to deal with that 30% tax that Apple implements with the App Store. So these are all ways for, as a developer, to get around that. So a lot of gibberish right here, but it's important if you guys are on the developer side and actually use the developer program as it's intended. But then also, if you go down here into UI Kit, this is the one that I think is gonna have the biggest repercussions in a positive way, right? So all animations created with UI View block APIs or UI View property animators run up to 120 Hertz on iPhones with ProMotion displays. So Apple is finally allowing third-party applications to implement and to add, like activate 120 Hertz on third-party applications. Because right now, the only applications that are 120 Hertz capable are native Apple apps. So Apple has finally opened the door a little bit for developers to use this new UI kit in order to get you 120 Hertz on all iPad Pros that have ProMotion and then all the new iPhone 13 Pro lineup of phones like the 13 Pro and the Pro Max, which now have that ProMotion display as well. But in terms of features, that's pretty much it. So now we're gonna move on to the actual battery life and see how we've been doing with iPad OS. Cause I've seen some mixed reviews, especially in the comment section of my videos of people getting, you know, 10 to 12 hours of battery life, but then other people like myself that get like two, three hours of battery life. So if we go into the battery life section, go in the last 10 days, 
I'm gonna click on a big day like this one. So you can see that we were doing about five hours and 42 minutes of screen on time, but we charged over 125%. So we had five hours and 45 minutes of screen on time and almost three hours of screen off time. Combine that, that gives you about eight to nine hours, but we did charge it over 100% that day. But if you go on a day like Monday, you can see we have two hours and 45 minutes of screen on time, so almost three hours, and we only charge about 50%. So on a day like that, you could assume that we're getting five to six hours of battery life. We're still not touching that 10 hours of battery life that Apple did promise us on the iPad OS side, but also keep in mind that I'm using very task intensive applications and third party applications like LumaFusion, like Affinity Photo. Those are things that are gonna take up a lot of battery. Like if you're sitting there and just watching Apple TV, you're probably gonna get 10 to 12 hours of battery life, especially if you're just watching it especially if you're watching something that's already been downloaded onto your device, then you're gonna get the most optimized level of battery life, especially if you're in Safari, or again, inside of the native applications that Apple has created. Once you leave those applications, the battery optimization kind of leaves a little bit, and that's what happens and you start getting this two hours and 45 minutes, or again, on a day like Wednesday, where we charged it about 150% and only got almost six hours of battery life. But then if you go on a smaller day like Saturday or Sunday, you can see that we had an hour and a half of screen on time with less than 25% of battery use. That's a six or seven hour day. And you can see Disney Plus was the biggest culprit of that. But that's how we're doing with battery life. So overall, it's getting decent. And if you wanna stay inside of the native applications, you're gonna get the most battery life. But outside of that, you're gonna deal with anywhere from four to eight hours, especially if you're using things like LumaFusion, you know, editing 4K video, editing a bunch of images with a bunch of layers like I do in Affinity Photo. But outside of that, you'll get your eight to 10 hours of battery life. And then in terms of performance, it's looking good, right? Everything is smooth. The 120 Hertz is still rocking as fast as it can. Control center is there. Your notifications are still popping up. Control center has been working well. And I've actually been using focus modes a lot. So if you guys wanna see a video of how I've been organizing my focus modes lately, because honestly, focus modes is one of the biggest sleeper features from iPadOS 15 that people are really not taking advantage of. And at first I thought it was a little bit of a gimmick, but focus modes do help a lot. But overall, from a performance standpoint, couldn't be happier with how fluid iPadOS, especially in the beta program, has been running. Even with using shortcuts like these app icons, it still has a little drop down, but it works relatively quickly. So overall, I'm happy with the performance. We just got to get that battery life up. But let's finish up this video and get out of this view. So that's pretty much going to do it for this video, everybody. Like you saw, there was a couple of new updates, but most of them were in the back end. But the number one update that I think is going to have the biggest impact moving forward is that third party developers will now have the ability to optimize and create their apps for that 120 hertz kind of pro motion display that now the iPad Pros have, but then also the iPhone 13s finally picked up, or at least the 13 Pro lineup finally picked up this year. And Apple's been keeping that 120 hertz display capability to their native applications, but now they seem to be opening up to everybody. Now don't assume that because that happened, now all of your applications magically are gonna be compatible with 120 hertz. This is still in the beta program, so it's gonna take the App Store developers a little bit of time to actually get their apps updated for 120 hertz, so they're gonna have to reconfigure it. So be on the lookout for whenever 15.5, the official release drops, watch out for a bunch of updates in your app store with your applications because all those apps or most of those apps are gonna be quickly optimized 420 hertz refresh rates on the iPhone 13 Pro Max and also the Pro Motion display on the iPad Pro lineup. But outside of that, we saw some small tangible differences, but with a 15.5 update, it's gonna be mostly backend stuff. Apple gave us that 15.4 wow factor feature, which was universal control. So now they're solidifying everything with 15.5 and getting the public ready for that final iPad OS 16 release, which probably is gonna be announced in June of WWDC and then finally released to everybody by September, October, whenever the new iPhones get released. But that's gonna do it for this video, everybody. If you learned something new, leave a comment down below. And if you made it to the end, leave a little dolphin in the comments as well. I like to see who made it to the end. And if you wanna see some more iPadOS update videos or how well Microsoft works on the new M1 machines, click on one of these videos right here. But until next time, peace.